I'm Jeff Trexler. Uh, I am uh, formerly known as the Associate Director of the Fashion Law Institute. For the past couple years, I've been the Interim Director of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, uh, where the issue of, believe it or not, apparel has been a big problem, a big question, uh, from what people can wear dressed in cosplay and convention floors to a case that I've been in the midst of as counsel uh, for Maya Kobe, the author of uh, Genderqueer, uh, and the whole question of, of identity uh, and sexual identity and sexual expression, uh, having had to defend against an obscenity charge in Virginia Beach, where they were literally trying to get a graphic novel banned for exploring these very issues. Uh, we have an amazing, amazing panel today uh, with incredible panelists. Uh, and now that you know who I am, uh, I would wonder if our panelists could introduce themselves. Just say a brief uh, word about yourselves and, 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 and what you do and why you're here. Sure. Um, I'm Susan Scafidi, so now you know how to pronounce it. it rhymes with graffiti, as Joe Miller will always remember. Um, and where's Joe? And, uh, but, uh, and I am the uh, founder and director of the Fashion Law Institute, and I teach here at Fordham. And I'm really thrilled that you all are here today. And I'm almost decent, but it depends on what I do with these zippers. <laughs> <laughs> Press up, I think. That's what it did for me. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought they were live. Hi, my name is Kimberly Jenkins. I'm a professor of fashion, fashion studies. I've taught at Parsons School of Design, Pratt Institute. Uh, I was an assistant professor of fashion studies at Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, I'm based here. Um, I'm also the founder of the Fashion and Race Database. I created a course called Fashion and Race at Parsons. Uh, I also teach fashion theory, like why we wear what we wear. And I have a consultancy called Artist Solomon, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit in my presentation. Wow, you are busy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Marley Holmes, and I am actually in a little bit of a different industry now. Um, I'm, I'm the Senior Director for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Save the Children, which is a huge humanitarian organization. But prior to my career at Save, I was actually an immigration attorney for many years, both at a law firm, and then I went in-house as general counsel to Wilhelmina Models um, and you know, developed a great relationship with Susan just um, at my time and tenure there. So uh, happy to be here and be part of this discussion. And it's, it's an amazing panelist, so I'm going to keep my comments here very short so you can hear about this from the stars of the show. Um, the question of decency is one that several years ago you might have been tempted to think of it as, as quaint. You know, decency is what you were concerned about in the 19... 50s, maybe, uh, but now we're way beyond that. We've we've had so many revolution, revolutions in terms of values and free expression here as a society. Who's who's thinking about these questions? Uh, but now you can have your fashion or your modeling photos banned from Facebook or Instagram or TikTok if they're deemed to be indecent. Uh, you can be arrested, you could go to jail, uh, depending on where you live. You could have a book that features certain images. Uh, pulled from a school or, as I just recently went through in Virginia Beach, uh, there could be a proposal to, or even a court case, to try to get it banned. And to start, uh, I'd like to hear from Professor Scafidi. You've thought a lot about the questions of decency, obscenity, and these sort of issues. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this question. I yeah, have, just a little bit. And I want to note that I get to talk about decency with my mom in the room. So I'll try to keep it clean, but there may be a few pictures that uh, are, are going to get me sent to my room. Uh, but in, in, in the meantime, so um, as, as uh, Professor Trexler, actually, he teaches our fashion ethics course, uh, mentioned, uh, this is a, a very much an issue in the comics community as well. And so I wanted to thank the CBLDF, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, for co-sponsoring this panel with us. And it was originally premiered at Comic-Con in San Diego. Um, so this is the New York, uh, the up updated, upgraded version for New York. All right. So we start always with a question. Are you decent? Gilda, are you decent? <laughs> Me? <laughs> sure, I'm decent. <laughs> A lot of unpacking that question and what it means from a social perspective. We throw that word around a lot. He's a decent guy. Are you decent? Uh, all sorts of ways of asking that question. Uh, but it really goes, at the end of the day, to uh, way back, right, to Adam and Eve. They, they, they ate the fruit of the forbidden tree, and the first thing they realized was, oh, dear, we're, we're not decent, and went to do something about it, or so, we t or so we tell ourselves, right? And I have an archbishop in the room, so I hope that was OK. Um, 
Uh, uh, decency comes down to, to uh, really two issues. Your appearance, this is Annette Kellerman, an Australian uh, award-winning swimmer who pioneered the one-piece bathing suit for women as opposed to wearing pantaloons and trying to drag those through the water and claims to have been arrested for doing so. Certainly there's lots of questions about decency. And then there are questions of indecent actions. Okay, I don't think the flash is actually a flasher. However, the pun was too good to resist. However, the way we think about decency also depends on the bodies we're talking about. So there are gender differences. No one raises, raises an eyebrow at the naked cowboy, but the desnudas in Times Square were actually nearly banned. Similarly, and I think that Kim may speak a bit more about this, racial differences in how we perceive decency. Regional differences. These are actual fashion police, the morality police in Iran. Um, citing a woman for not being covered up enough, but around the same time in France, we have the police ordering a woman to remove clothing at the beach because she's too covered um, in, in, in those terms. But it's not just a, a question abroad. This is, uh, these are images from a weather report on a California news station where the, the um, individual, the meteorologist giving the weather report showed up, the dress she intended to wear clashed with the green screen. She put on a cocktail dress she had ready for evening. I think she looks not only decent, but rather nice. But one of her colleagues, while she was on live camera, handed her a sweater, which she's a good sport. Uh, she put on the sweater and said later, oh, it's OK, we're good friends. But of course, the internet lit up at, at how horrifying it was to have this male colleague insist that his female colleague put on more clothes. Um, Legally, when we're talking about defining indecent exp exposure or public lewdness, we do it in a number of ways. We do it via laws, and every state, many jurisdictions have laws about this. Rules, dress codes uh, uh, related to organizations, schools, workplaces, comic cons, and of course, social norms. We police one another very rigorously when, when it comes to decency. I'd like to show us very quickly an example from the New York Penal Code, uh, which says that a person is guilty of public lewdness when they expose private or intimate parts um, or commit any other lewd act. So again, appearance and action in a public place, or they can be seen from deliberately from a public place. Exposure, we, we, we define, we further go on to define as appearance with private or intimate parts uncovered, and, the, and also the question of the breasts, and the female breasts specifically, or uh, female people. Now, this, these are old laws. Uh, this doesn't, um, so we're still stuck in the gender binary, as are our bathrooms down the hallway, I noticed. But, but there's, so there's some very specific definitions of what is and what is not decent, and it does vary by gender. Um, there is, however, since we're going into New York Fashion Week, an exception. There's an exception for showing images or, or, or appearing in public breastfeeding, but there's also an exception for appearing in a play, an exhibition, a show, or an entertainment. So should uh, Rick Owens want to send these guys down his runway again, uh, uncovered. He did this in Paris, but it would also technically be OK in New York. Um, it, again, might raise some eyebrows. And he did intend to start a conversation around objectification of the male body as well as the female body. Uh, but it would, in fact, be legal. Um, if he were to just decide to send these guys on the street out afterwards, not as part of the show, they might very well be arrested. So uh, then there's the question of dress codes. This is an example from the Colorado Anime Fest, so borrowing again from the, the comics world, but we have lots of different rules around conventions. Um, these guys not only had text in their, in their uh, guidelines for the convention, but sent everyone a graphic on what's OK and what's not OK. I don't know if you can read the details, but it goes right down to no cheeks and no side boob. Um, so very detailed instructions on what is and what is not considered decent, because they intend for this to be um, a convention for everyone to be comfortable. We've seen actual bans on gender-specific clothing, uh, with the Tokyo Comic Con banning men dressing as female characters. Now, that ban was almost immediately rescinded, uh, but uh, men and women, again, with the binary, were still issued different ident identity passes uh, corresponding which, to which bathrooms they could use. So you see the issue. We've had controversial rules online as well around community guidelines. And this is a New York Times headline, will Instagram ever free the nipple? Well, Instagram is moving in that direction, right? Um, they do ban uh, certain kinds of imagery. Um, but over time, as they've been criticized for doing so, they too have decided to uh, modify their community guidelines to include 
include other other reasons for uh, for showing breasts and, and, and particularly nipples. Um, that being said, when Adidas ran this ad earlier in the year, they released it on Twitter, not on Instagram. All right, sorry, mom. Um, so, uh, and, and as I mentioned, we also police one another via social norms. Some of you who have been in my class know that I particularly like this photograph that was part of an art project by a woman who was a high school student at the time called Judgments. And what she has written on different parts of the leg correspond to different perceptions of different hemlines, ranging from matronly at the ankle to proper at the knee to some rather nasty words, a lot higher than that. So we do police one another. In addition to the question of whether something is decent, is decent um, legally or uh, according to our various codes or social norms, we ask the question of whether something is obscene. Uh, and that refers to not how we appear in public or pictures of ourselves online, uh, but to, to uh, creative works, including the one uh, that uh, Professor Trexler just defended in the state of Virginia and won, by the way, um, at least until there's an appeal. So we'll see where that goes. So my Kababe's book, Gender Queer, uh, currently. Um, so we're, we're dealing here with depiction and description. Of course, when we're in the online context, as we move into virtual realities and the metaverse, these things are going to come together. Our depictions are also uh, 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 our works of art, essentially. They're caricatures, but they're also ourselves. So we'll have to develop new questions going, going forward about how we deal with virtual realities and also how we deal with augmented realities. Right? If we can walk around wearing actual x-ray glasses, what does that mean in terms of decency and privacy as well? This is the, the gold standard um, out of the US Supreme Court, Miller against California, for how we interpret obscenity laws in the US. And perhaps, perhaps Professor Trexel will, will speak to this later. Uh, but I wanted to, to make sure that you know what the touchstone is. We're looking at whether the average person applying contemporary community standards, which is why decency can vary from state to state or town, down to, or town, to town um, finds that the work as a whole appeals to the prurient interests, whether the work describes describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct, and whether the work as a whole lacks serious literary or artistic, et cetera, political or scientific value. But so we have a very narrow definition of what is obscene, what can be banned by the government. But even if our work isn't obscene, and thus is protected by the First Amendment, what about kids? Well, the US Congress has tried a few times to protect specifically young people. The Communications Decency Act, unconstitutional. The Child Online Protection Act, unconstitutional. But then we get the Children's Internet Protection Act, and we do have some limits on what can be shown to children. This is administered by the, via filters and things so that adults can access the material. It's not banned by the government, but children cannot. There's some other, other considerations in this area that we, as a legal community, need to think about. Um, there are IP questions uh, that, that relate directly to decency. When we have things like uh, unauthorized comics showing Mickey and Minnie doing things that Mickey and Minnie never did under Walt Disney's authority, which is why they still have no children. Um, so uh, so we, could, we, could, we could ban these sort of things based on uh, and, and challenge the, the argument that they are uh, our parody uh, because we are concerned about the decency issues. Also in trademark, there's, there's a specifically in trademark dilution, uh, dilution by tarnishment, which would, go, uh, which would address the question of whether an unauthorized use of a trademark is damaging the mark by associating it with things that we consider to be indecent. We can also ask the question in an employment law context, when we're asking people to wear certain uniforms, and often there's gender differential here as well. This clip from The Boys, available on Amazon Prime. Brick Road. And hello, Starlight. A new costume. I can't wear that. <laughs> yeah, I'm with her. I can't wear that. <laughs> Certainly not in my job. Um, and if I'm a superhero rescuing people, that's definitely not what I'm wearing. <laughs> Uh, we also, of course, still engage in lots of self-censorship in, in the print area. This is not my grocery list, and it is probably not yours either. So um, what, we, what we do know, there's a lot, not a lot that we don't know about decency and what is and isn't decent, but what we do know is that standards are evolving. And Pache called Porter, everything does not go. So with that, I want to hand the mic over to Kim. Who Thank you. That 
I loved that. Um, so many intersections with fashion studies, what I teach, and I also love the judgment image. I use that in the classroom as well. Um, what you were talking about, it reminds me of, also, I went to the West Indian Day Parade on Monday, and it got me thinking about decency and how sometimes the rigid um, norms around decency or the rules are suspended by time and place. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, you can have at it. You know, there was a woman dancing in the parade just covering her breasts, you know. You know, everyone can be free in that way um, and kind of flout those rules as long as it's confined to a certain space and time. And then, you know, outside of that, you know, the rules come back up again. Um, is this my clicker? Okay. So I'm going to dive right into the work I do. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, I created a learning platform, learning and resource platform called the Fashion and Race Database, which, long story short, it came out of creating a course in 2016 at Parsons School of Design called Fashion and Race. And it's been evolving since then. Um, and I explore all of the intersections of fashion and race, uh, racialized aesthetics, and things like that. Um, and then I also created a consultant uh, consultancy after working with fashion brands like Gucci and partnering with Tommy Hilfiger um, to just kind of exp help them with uh, cultural awareness and sensitivity and things like that. I also work with the entertainment industry um, in kind of checking fashion history and making sure that racialized stories are told in an accurate manner. Uh, things like that. Um, so I've been teaching about why we wear what we wear and fashion and race for, uh, well, fashion and race in the last uh, six or so years, but uh, fashion in general for about 10 years. Okay, so um, I'm actually pulling this from a section I teach in fashion and race at Parsons and, and now more broadly um, with the fashion and race database. And um, that is what I consider to be the limits of fashionability, which we can take all the way back into history. Um, so again, I don't have a whole lot of time to present, so I want to just kind of give you uh, a crash course here. Um, so in terms of historical context, this image I, I decided to use uh, is one of several um, that I use from the Life in Philadelphia se series by William Edward Clay. Um, me and actually my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Square, uh, when we were having a traveling workshop called Fashion and Justice. And so we loved using these images um, because these images, these illustrations, and there's many of them, they were designed to mock black people, newly freed black people, who wanted to participate in fashion. And so this is why I start with the limits of fashionability. So, um, so as soon as you have freed black people starting to participate in fashion and the silhouettes, taking on the silhouettes and the colors and having fun with it, these mocking illustrations that were in this gazette um, was sort of this inside joke for white people to look at and think, oh my gosh, look at these black people trying to be fashionable, they're getting it wrong. And as you can see, this is a very unfortunate flattering image, the way that they drew the figures is to make them look almost ape-like. Um, and so, again, if you look up the Life in Philadelphia series, you'll see more of these. And they're designed to mock and dehumanize um, these people and let them know they're getting it wrong. And one key aspect about fashion, and we talk about this in fashion studies, is, it, is about knowledge. So it's always about knowing the right brand, the right colors, the right time to wear something, the wrong time to wear something, the right silhouettes. And so that's how it also ties in with decency and respect is being in the know, what sort of brands you should wear, what brands you shouldn't wear in a certain environment. And so when you have uh, fashion leaders or sort of judging individuals in fashion looking at you, they're reading you and seeing um, you know, if you're fashionable or not, if you're in the know, oh gosh, they look like they're wearing a ton of logos, they're not in the know like I am, who, and I know how to wear um, more subtle, fashionable items without the logos. So it, it's all the nuances about that that leads to judgment. Um, so coming back to historical context, um, just some moments throughout history that you could look to is the Negro Law of South Carolina in 1740, which was a whole law designed to restrict what black people then enslaved could wear. Um, so it was a whole list of, you know, 
the, the textiles, the actual materials that black people were allowed to wear and what they couldn't. And that was designed to be a check in society um, to regulate a sumptuary law, essentially. Um, 19th century, we have Negro cloth during times of enslavement. Um, Negro cloth was an umbrella term to cover some of the most unattractive, uncomfortable materials that were used to design the uniforms or clothing uh, of enslaved people. It was not designed to help you stand out and feel good about yourself and be comfortable. Um, it was almost like burlap sack material. Um, and also in the 19th century, you see how dress was used as a tool for tracking and dehumanization. Um, so again, I can't go too far into it, but when you had, you had all these strategies of black people who were enslaved trying to escape for freedom, and they were taking on different strategies from cross-dressing to dressing outside of their station to try to get away and pass um, so that they weren't, you know, kind of clocked as an enslaved person. Um, and so... You have that, and this illustration is also speaking to how um, dress was used to dehumanize uh, enslaved people. You also see this happening today in terms of sort of the fashion crowd or fashion elites making fun of um, racialized people, especially black people, who love bright colors. Case in point, I have a dear friend, just to keep all of this anonymous, um, who worked in the fashion industry, and he went on to work for a sportswear brand up north, and um, one of the C-suite executives told him when he came out with a um, swatch book of, these are the colors I think would be nice for our jackets and outerwear. She told him, I think those primary colors you're showing are the kinds of colors that black people wear, and I do not want that. You know, scrap it. And so she's like, they wear those kinds of colors, and we need to uphold, you know, this certain ideal. Um, so things like that and how all of those nuances into reading fashion and associating it with certain racialized people is used. Um, and then from the 19th century onwards, you see shifting dress signifiers. So, you know, it's this constant moving of the goalpost of as soon as fur coats are um, conspicuous of leisure and luxury and wealth for white women, when you see black women catch up and start wearing it, you've got to move the goalpost further. Oh, no. Fur coats are, you know, past, you know they're, they're out of um, style now. So um, we would never wear that. And so then you're leaving the people who, you know, are kind of d down in the caste system um, wearing something that's now out of vogue. So you're constantly changing the rules and codes of fashionability um, to keep that hierarchy in check. Um, and also in the early 20th century, you have negrophilia. So um, this relates to, and I'll, I'll mention this on the next couple of slides, um, the work of um, the late scholar Patrine Archer Straw. Her book, Negrophilia, which I assigned in my fashion and race course, um, was talking about kind of 1920s hipster Paris and the, amongst the avant-garde and how all of these white men and women were fetishizing black culture from adopting jazz music, jazz style, primitive African fashion, adorning their homes with African masks, um, cutting their hair like Josephine Baker. It was definitely trying to keep this distance from blackness, but also consuming it and um, kind of a, changing it in a way, and, and I'll mention this in my next slide. Um, it, it's this way of taking it, sanitizing it, renaming it, and kind of creating it for your own means. Um, so, so those are some aspects of Negrophilia, and especially about deciding what the right kind of Africanness or blackness is. So some of the um, Negrophiles, as they were called, um, would go to various countries in Africa and find the right kind of mask or the right kind of African style. And they would decide, because they're French men, this is African style. Um, this is the right kind of culture. And then, um, for my last bullet point, um, from the early 20th century onwards, you see the appropriation of black music style, from jazz music to um, uh, Motown sound, hip it, it, in the 60s, mo, um, hip hop style in the 80s and 90s, how um, the, the dress and the mannerisms and everything that came out of those styles were then sort of appropriated um, by the dominant culture. 
Um, now, theoretical application, and this is kind of just in my wheelhouse here, we also apply theory in talking about this. Um, and I know this is all pretty heavy, so I'm just going to kind of run through it. But um, the construct of race and this dominant narrative of the black body, it's considered to be grotesque, which leads to all of this. So it's important to have this kind of foundation here of where does all of this come from and this running away from black people catching up with our uh, fashionability. So it's all coming from this construct of race and that um, black culture is closer to primitive culture and, and all of these just heinous illustrations over time and writings and, and films that were designed to kind of reinforce those narratives that they're at the bottom of the caste system. So you wonder why Serena Williams is having to go through all of this um, dehumanization about her body and how it just doesn't look classy, you know, or elegant or refined or sophisticated in the outfit she wears. I mean, I think some of us remember that uh, terrible illustration that was done of her to kind of play up the angry um, ape-like black woman. So, you know, all of these things work in tandem towards anti-blackness, which is my next point. Um, and so, again, sort of like when I was using the example of the fur coat, oh no, black women are wearing it, got to make it, you know, not stylish anymore. This fear of contagion or sameness, um, constantly moving the goalpost, and also strategies to protect luxury and elite aesthetics. So um, I see this also firsthand in the fashion industry of how um, as soon as racialized various, not just black people, racialized groups, as soon as they start being able to co-opt into luxury or it's elite aesthetics, you've got to change it. Um, I went to Italy a few years ago, and the escort who um, met me to take me to this, to a certain designer brand's headquarters, actually told me, you know, the areas he felt that I should avoid because the Chinese go there. All the, the bougie Chinese who come and love luxury fashion. He's like, I, if I were you, I would avoid those streets. They're just so terrible. They, they're just going and buying up all the luxury brands and they're just so obsessed with that. And he felt like it like contagion, it, it had soiled or put a damper on um, the value of these brands and this luxury as soon as they start getting their hands on it. Um, and so then, you know, a treasure trove. You see the perpetual system of extracting, as I was saying from Negrophilia, of non-white aesthetics. So turning around and taking maybe a braided hairstyle or a certain element of hip hop culture, you take it. Um, you refine it, and you rename it, and then you reintroduce it to society, slapping your own fashion brand on it or giving it a whole new name. Um, and so fashion relies on aspiration and hierarchies um, to keep all of this going. Um, so recent cases we've seen up until now, who's, he's now getting his credit, the uncredited uncredited inspiration from tastemakers, the likes of Dapper Dan. His style, you know, was seen as ghetto or too hood to have all these logos or these styles, but then when other brands, you know, jump in on it, then it suddenly becomes elevated. That's another word we like to use is we are elevating it. Um, and then you also see elements of select appropriated aesthetics of black, black and love next women um, through black fishing. So it's taking the style or darkening your skin and just basically taking everything from that body um, through the privilege of your whiteness. Um, and then the widespread adoption of streetwear. Case in point, how in the last 20 years, sneakers have come into vogue. And now you see $880 sneakers on NeimanMarcus.com, you know, when it was considered, you know, too inappropriate or indecent to wear in, in proper fashion spaces. Um, and so just some quick notable research. Again, um, I recommend uh, Between Archer Straw's book on dress and black fetishism through Negrophilia. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Michael Squares, Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom, um, which tracks this through history. Um, it's a digital humanities project. Um, professor, um, historian, Tanisha C. Ford, also a colleague of mine. Um, I'm excited to see her latest work coming out. She's written about black uh, women's dress through um, protest in the civil rights era, but now she's going even deeper in writing a book on um, the hidden stories of black women philanthropists, um, where people thought in the mid-century philanthropists were only white women who, you know, just wearing their pearl necklaces and doing lunch, you know, around town here. But uh, Tanisha Ford is unearthing all the stories of um, black women and wealth. 
Um, and then Cassie Pittman, uh, Clay Clayter's field work on race-based re retail discrimination. Um, one of her articles that I uh, assign in my class is called Shopping While Black. And it's so eye-opening eye because it talks about um, racialized retail discrimination and all of the strategies that black people would do just to prepare themselves mentally and aesthetically to step into retail spaces. Everything from getting their comportment correct to wearing the right kind of outfit, which means maybe overdressing compared to their white counterparts when they walk into a retail store. So all of that mental and emotional labor and physical labor just to shop. So, uh, so she talks about that. I highly recommend um, her article on that. Um, so just in closing, um, if you're interested in more about this, um, fashionandrace.org is my website that collects all the resources, articles, books, things like that. Um, there, it is a subscription, so you can subscribe as an individual, institution, or as a business. Um, my consultancy is Artist Solomon. Um, and then recently, I partnered with Tommy Hilfiger to uh, produce a podcast called The Invisible Seam, Unsung Stories of Black Culture and Fashion. One episode I recommend is Rhythm and Muse. Um, um, where we talk about hip hop culture's influence on fashion with a capital F and how luxury fashion really kind of borrowed from it. And some of the horrific stories that happened in the 90s to people like Monica Morrow in that episode you'll hear where she, she went shopping as a stylist um, before stylists for music videos became a thing, she went into a luxury retail store and she and her friend were slammed against a police car accused of theft when they were actually, they knew the people in the store, the people, you know, they, they had a relationship with them and they said no, you know, the people came running out of the store to say, she's cool, she's just here to get clothes for a music video. So, um, so this is um, just some of the critical work that needs to be explored when we talk about um, fashion and limits and decency. Yeah, and I'm happy to, I'm sorry, um, I'm happy to kind of change the subject a little bit in that, you know, my experience in, in, in decency and, and how I viewed in fashion kind of um, was a was a different um, sort of background. So like I said, you know, I started off as an immigration attorney. I worked at traditional big law firms um, in Atlanta and here in New York City. Um, I went into Wilhelmina Models because I was brought in to really do the visas for all of the, um, for, for the models. And that expanded to a general counsel role. And so my intro to fashion was really kind of a, a crash course in where the hell am I now? Because you know, coming from a big law firm where when you think of decency, it's really the expectation, right? Because there's a bit of a conservative nature in the way that you dress and carry yourself, et cetera. So going from there to an agency, particularly a fashion one, um, was quite an experience. And I remember one of the first things I had to do was look at our employee handbook because literally, there were two, com two parts to Wilhelmina. There was the you know, traditional models, 14 and up, and then we also had a kids division called Wilhelmina Kids. And you know, we had agents who wore whatever they wanted, which again, was new to me, right? Um, and we had kids coming in who you know, were obviously very young and impressionable. And so I had to look at the handbook and ask myself, like, can you wear jean shorts that are that short, right? And then I had to go to the agents and say, I don't think you can wear that, to which they said, who are you? <laughs> um, you know, we never had an in-house counsel. And I said, well, I know that this is new, but we're going to have to all figure out how to make this work. So one, we're compliant in whatever ways we need to be compliant. And two, you know, we are fostering an environment where children can be here um, as well as the models. And again, 14 is also underage, you know, so even if you have a model who um, is being groomed for adult modeling, you know, they're, they're, they're still starting off relatively young. And so there was a huge battle when I first started in terms of, again, looking at our employee handbook and really kind of looking at our dress code. Um, but also wanting to maintain the creativity, you know, and individualism that comes with fashion and comes with an agency. And so, you know, I really leaned on the agents to work with me so that we could figure something out that was a compromise, you know? In that, you know, again, we need to be able to express ourselves, whether that's in colors or styles, but, you know, we agreed on length of clothes, what was being exposed, et cetera. And so that did go into our handbook. The other thing that we did was also created a separate entrance for our kids. Because one of the other concerns is, you know, because we also had models walking around who were, you know, 18 and up or what have you, 
they were, you know, independent contractors. So our employee handbook couldn't apply to them. So, you know, in entering the Wilhelmina premises, they could wear whatever they want and, and you know, I could kindly ask, you know, their kids here as well, you know, can, can, can we tone that down or whatever, but, but I, I technically didn't have authority over them, right, because I didn't have control over them. So we created a separate entrance for our Wilhelmina kids um, just to ensure that, again, you know, that, that, that there was a separation in terms of what our kids needed to be exposed to versus, you know, the style of our, um, you know, of our of our models, and then again the individualism of our um, of our agents. So it was an interesting um, time, um, you know, because obviously you're, you're you're working on these many issues and understanding that, you know, again it's an agency and there are different, uh, you know, applicable understandings in terms of, you know, what's what's expected. And then the Me Too movement happened. So at that time, you know, it, it really was at a critical time because we're having these conversations. The Me Too movement happens. Um, and so there was a lot of effort that went into looking at, again, you know, decency in terms of, you know, behavior. Um, but we also had to then change the policy somewhat again when it came to our agents because, you know, at that time, fashion and agents and, you know, um, photographers, like everybody was kind of under the gun, right, in terms of, you know, like really, really being, um, you know, reviewed for, 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 you know, conduct, et cetera. And again, you know, my entire focus was really, you know, I wanted to make sure that our agents were able to really kind of, you know, have that creativity, but I was always thinking of our underage, you know, um, children and, and, and even some of our agents, honestly, you know, we did have interns there that wanted to get into the fashion industry. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting time just because there were all of these, you know, issues that were arising from a society standpoint, and internally we were looking at it, but also understanding that you know we're in a space, um, you know, that really kind of expresses itself in, in, in different ways, you know. And so, how do you kind of balance those two needs, um, you know, at a time where there were also legal implications that we had to, to consider? So I'll stop there and just kind of see um, where we're going to take the conversation next. Um, I, I I want to build on that. There yeah. Are questions that I'm having to deal with and uh, one one issue is I, I'd like to hear more about how you dealt with things contractually um, was it something that I know we included something in the CLE I will mean a contract that's posted online how did you deal with questions of nudity how did you deal with the, the what specific how, how do you take these concerns and put them into words yeah so well there are two there are two um, ways to look at this, right? So when it came to our agents, again, you know, because they were actual employees, you know, we could have those conversations and ensure that their employment agreements, you know, were compliant. You know, you're if you're going to take an image of, you know, uh, that that might expose more than should be exposed, like the parent has to approve it or, or what have you, you know, agree to it. Um, when it came to our models, again, because they were independent contractors, it really was a matter of looking at the agreements, and I reviewed all of the agreements, right? They were coming from um, clients, you know, um, designers or what have you, in terms of you know, what the scope of the work would be. Um, and if I did feel like this is inappropriate for somebody at this age, I would cross it out. Um, and I would have the conversation with the parent, this is why I crossed it out. You know, or, or I would say, I, we're not going to do this job, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I think I established a, a good enough rapport with parents and with models where typically, again, you know, they, they leaned on me when it came to reviewing these agreements. But again, when it came to our agents, you know, I could facilitate that control a little more just because they were, um, they, they were our employees. And how do you, and this is a question to all of you, because there's, there's a, a, some interesting texts and subtexts here, just in terms of the relationship between uh, concern or protection, uh, decency as, as a way of protecting children, protecting individuals, you mentioned the Me Too movement, uh, but also as a way of social control or exploitation. Uh, and I want to ask a question a bit about line drawing, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one that's been in the news recent, recently, and it's obviously something I've been doing a lot of work with, which is gender identity and gender expression. Um, we're seeing uh, in, in the comics community, it's one where uh, it's, there's a lot of openness, a lot of freedom in the comics community, a sense that anybody should be whatever they want to be. They shouldn't be bound just as a superhero can fly off the page. You know, pe individuals should be whatever they want to be and not be bound by convention or rules. 
And so I think it's it's there's been a natural alignment it, with the drag community and like Drag Queen Story Hour. We do the graphic novels and libraries and things like that. And uh, it used to be called gender swapping, and I think there's more of a fluid concept. But back when it was more binary, uh, gender swapping in terms of characters and cosplay conventions. Uh, and we're seeing this now in, in fashion shows. And I know there was a controversy uh, just over the past several weeks about these are trans kids in fashion shows. And how do you draw the line between um, we want to protect the children, we want to protect this community, we want to protect women, and we're using this to stop a certain lifestyle, a certain identity from um, becoming accepted as a norm. This is open to all of you. I don't even know how to begin tackling that because, I mean, you're right, right? It, I, I'm, I'm absorbing the question. Um, look, I mean, I think as a lawyer, your your first uh, your first approach is going to be one of two. How do I protect what I'm supposed to be protecting, right? And is there a liability? Is there risk and liability here? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I really kind of look at it as, is, you know, are you do you have the ability to consent? And if you don't have the ability to consent, I think that's really just kind of what is my guiding principle. And so, you know, I, I think that we're going to really kind of see where consent is given by the parent, you know, as it relates to that, or, or I, you know, or there's some sort of separation, you know, in, in, you know, with family. So the individual has their ability to consent. But I mean, it's a, it's a tough question to, to answer because it's really going to come down to, as a, from a society, like who is able to really just kind of give the consent in terms of what you're able to expose or, or, or share with the world. Could you repeat that question one more time? How do we draw the line between um, protect, decency as a form of protection, uh, whether it's protecting society, protecting individuals, protecting the person portrayed, uh, and uh, control? Um, and and preventing certain norms. I mean, I thought your presentation was fascinating, by the way, uh, particularly on that. That's uh, and the question largely drew out of that, and also the discussion of of modeling and protection of children. Um, how how do you make those difficult calls? Is is the concept of decency itself indecent, inherently exploitive? Are there ways we can sort of bound it so that it avoids a lot of the problems that you mentioned in your talk? So sort of like where's that line? Yeah. How how do we the, the practical person. work for as a society in terms of our first graffiti talked about uh, laws and norms uh, and are we looking at the role at, at where um, enforcement of decency becomes excessive control where we move from appropriateness to paternalism is that yeah, that, that that's part of the good part of the question yeah. mm -hmm. mm. I'm thinking about the where so like where's that line mm -hmm. between decency and then and then letting the person sort of express themselves as they see yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh my gosh, that is a good question. So I'm not sure how to answer it. Um, I there is an answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't I don't know if there is an answer. I think we're I think we're living it now, right? I think we're really kind of experiencing where that's going to take us. Um, listen, these are all some of these are like just new concepts and 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 issues and conversations. I mean, we're starting to talk about it, which. Listen, even during the Me Too movement or whatever, or prior to that, we weren't talking about these things, you know? And, and, and everything was seen as either decent or not decent, and I think there was a very clear line, right? And, and, and I think we're kind of fluidly kind of moving in between both at this time. Um, you know, whether it comes to gender identity or gender norms or like even racial identity and racial norms, you know, and like there's just such a fluid mix of everything, you know, mm -hmm. like interracial marriages or not, like, you know, seeing the same, like everything is really, I think, moving towards a place where there is no black and white, you know, um, I think expression of decency or understanding of it, you know, I think that's where for me it comes down to consent based on what is it as an individual that you agree to or whoever has authority over you to help you make that decision, right? Um, where's that guiding light, I guess? Mm -hmm. it's, it's so fascinating to me that, Marilee, you worked with so much with teenagers, basically, yeah, teenagers. Uh, because that's where we see, I, I would think, a lot of the tension. Uh, because I can imagine um, the, the classic conversation between a parent and a teen saying, hey, you're not wearing that out of the house. And the teens answering, the enlightened modern teen saying something like, are you kidding? I'm an empowered woman, and I'm not ashamed of my body. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so don't body shame me. I'm, I'm wearing my you know, very short cutoffs or whatever they are. So there is, there is always that tension. Um, and I think you're right. And having to go one step beyond being the parent to being the, um, the trusted person at the agency, right? That's even a little harder. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, because you're dealing with, I mean, you're, you're thinking about, Oh, sorry. I should have used this earlier. Photographs, you know. I mean, these are uh, these are images and captures, you know, that sometimes can be used in perpetuity. You know, it's like these are the, these are issues that even as a parent and, and as a as a child, as a teenager, you're not thinking long term. You know, like, do you want that Calvin Klein image? And maybe you do. You know, but how about if it's in perpetuity? Or maybe you know, maybe you don't want that out there at some point. I, I don't know. You know, so it's just a matter of thinking long term in terms of where the consent should come from and where that sense of protection. And it's not always necessarily about decency in the way that I view decency, right? Because again, my image of decency is, 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 is pretty wide in that you know I've been exposed to a lot of different industries and areas in, in life, but it's more in terms of looking at that time and moment and whether or not there's protection towards the child, You know, in terms of whether they are being able to make the decision going forward in terms of what images are gonna be out there as it relates to what sort of exposure is gonna be out there for them. The line, it connects right back to what Kim was just saying about uh, uh, black people feeling like they, th like at certain points in history, and maybe still today, though God knows I hope not, having to, to, to dress more elaborately to walk into a retail store. It ties right back to our retail theft conversation on the previous panel. Right, You have to look that much better in order to be perceived as, as a, a decent enough human being to come shop here. Um, and, and that's really unfortunate. I wanted to answer, oh, oh please, oh, I and then I want to come back to your transcript. Well, I was going to add, and thank you for all the, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not a legal professional, so I'm not sure in terms of consent if, I, if I'm if i qualified to really speak too much on that. But I guess where my mind goes as a fashion studies scholar, when we talk about decency, I agree with Marilee. Um, from my perspective, um, the language and even the, the standards of what's acceptable in terms of decency is shifting. It's evolving and changing thanks to certain... Um, activist m movements that have happened. So um, my brain goes to like hairstyles or different um, clothes that we wear that were considered indecent. Um, not that it was doing any harm, but it was just sort of something we just weren't really ready for. We just didn't feel comfortable seeing someone look that way. Um, so I also think of like the natural hair movement of um, the last, you know, because I went naturally 20 years ago. Um, Obviously, I play with my hair a lot right now, but like I love just kind of the fluidity of just changing my look. And but something that I found so freeing was to be able to kind of tinker with indecency um, th at that time, which was letting my hair go or be free, and that was not considered respectable or decent. Um, <laughs> not only in in larger circles, but within the black community, my family they thought I was psychologically off because <laughs> I was truly. Because I, they couldn't believe, they actually did see it as indecency. It was almost like, well, you may as well walk out naked. How dare you? Because I was wearing, a, I was wearing, I had a headscarf moment also, and I was wearing headscarves, and then I would just let my natural hair, the way it looks, be out. And that was considered kind of like at the time when I grew up, in the 80s, my mom always had me, she was very old-fashioned, she um, had me wear slips. And it, I felt it felt so freeing to stop wearing slips under dresses. I was like, why was I doing this anyway? And then so to let my hair go naturally, it was also kind of taboo to do such a thing and just go out like that. Um, and so now it's, you know, widely accepted, though, I mean, as we've seen in the news, legal news, they're just now accepting natural hairstyles. Like California is writing it into law now that it's okay for black women to, you know, you shouldn't discriminate against them in an interview. So, but it's thanks to all of this push, which is taken decades to do. Um, and also, you know, when it comes to gender norms, thanks to kind of audacious individuals who just keep pushing and pushing and pushing our, you know, and challenging our norms or perceptions of what is decent um, to where it finally becomes the norm. Um, and Kim, I'll, I'll add to your point. It's interesting because I'm not going to like age myself, but uh, <laughs> I practiced a long time ago. And when I first started at a law firm, um, you know, I, I'm, my hair is obviously natural now, but it took me a long time to even evolve because I remember being at a law firm. I remember having a rough morning. If any of you are lawyers at big firms or thinking about it, they're long hours, you know, as, as you know. And my hair was natural, and I was told by a partner to slick my hair back. 
And I remember for many years, I had my own, like, you know, like issues with not wanting to wear my hair, you know, natural or what have you, and, and doing what most of us did at the time, you blew it out or whatever, um, to kind of fit into the, what, what, what the, I guess the standard at that time was, you know, in, in working in, in that, in, in a field and in that sort of profession. But it's interesting that when I, when I got to Wilhelmina, was really, again, you know, there were so many benefits to, to being in an environment that was much more free and, and, and evolved, I guess, you know, from a fashion standpoint. And that's where I really was like, what to hell with this, you know, and, and, I, and I went natural. Um, but I remember that, interesting enough, one of the biggest challenges that I had in speaking to our board, and at the time our CEO was very supportive of me, um, but our board was, you know, um, it was a publicly traded company, um, which is unusual for a modeling agency, um, but it was eight white men, you know, out, out of Texas, who, even though Willamina was started by a woman, so it was an interesting board and it wasn't diverse. And one of the big pushes that we made is, why do all our models look like they're from Sweden with blonde hair and blue eyes? This doesn't even look like the world, you know? And and I, and and you know, at the time we hadn't shifted to where we are now, but I was like, it's coming, you know, from a business standpoint. Our clients want to see other types of models. I want to see other types of models, you know. And so we geared um, a change in our scouting, going to places in Africa and Southeast Asia. We also looked at, you know, creating a curve department, a big and tall for men. But it was a huge resistance, right? Because our board was like, well, this isn't what, this isn't what the world wants to see as a model, because this doesn't look like a real model. And I was like, well, what is your definition of a real model, right? This is a beautiful person from, you know, like Sierra Leone or wherever they're from, you know what I mean? Who, listen, models aren't easy to find, okay? They are proportionally not what any, it, most people look like, right? Like, you, you know when you see a model. And, um, but there was a huge resistance because, again, you know, the idea of, like, bringing somebody from an African, from the African continent who had natural hair, you know, darker skin, bigger noses was just not, was, 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 was a fight because, and I remember, I don't think the word decency was used, but it was, this isn't, this isn't the norm of what a model should look like. Um, and that was a that was one of the biggest projects that I had while I was there. And again, I had a, a wonderful CEO who you know was hugely supportive of it. But it was a huge push with our board and even with our agents, to be honest, to get them on board because they were used to being able to place what a traditional model looked like. And the idea of having to work with somebody who looked different was just not something that they, you know, at that time, were you know in a in a place to to really understand. Such a tiny step between decency yeah. and beauty. Can I add one more thing? One more aspect, and also just because I love reading fashion and just being an observer. Um, one other kind of play with decency and resistance is that I really enjoy seeing is um, kind of fashion decency rebellion, as I'd see it. And that is, especially with the, the young black women I see who go out happily, like as an aesthetic, wearing their hair bonnets, you know, something you're supposed to sleep in. So taking it outside of the um, the um, rules of time and place, you know, bedroom, nighttime, and then, you know, to be so bold as to walk down the street, where, and they'll wear like these big furry slides, you know, and, you know, the designer bag and the hair bonnet, and guys also with the do-rags, because, you know, so it's this also, they know what they're doing, it's a negotiation of the boundaries of decency and offending people and seeing, you know, how dare you wear that outside of the time and place that you're supposed to wear that. So I also find that fascinating. Especially because it has a bedroom connotation, right? This is what you would wear to bed. What are you doing? What are you doing on the street like that? Uh. Absolutely. I wanted to come back to your trans question briefly because, uh, and also um, love that you referred to the Crown Acts, so look them up, the, 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 the acts about discrimination on the basis of hair, Crown, and it's, it's a wonderful acronym, um, but it, easy, it makes it easy to remember. Um, and, and so to, to follow up on that, and to follow up on, it's because I love giving you guys homework, um, to, uh, to, on, on Marilee's point, there was a, a, um, a reporter named Vivica Chen who wrote a great piece about something that happened at a large law firm where a, a junior editor from Glamour was brought in as a fun thing to do with the summer associates to give some beauty tips. And, and she actually told the women in the room not to wear their hair natural. And it was a, a, a huge Fluffle. It was probably 15 years ago now, but it could happen today, right? Um, and the the editor was not named in person. The the magazine apologized, but highly inappropriate and really damaging. Because if someone gives you that kind of advice as career advice, and you're concerned about advancing, of course you take it to heart, um, as as inappropriate and unfair as it might be. 
coming back to the trans question, um, you, you, you mentioned you know, drag queen story hour, and is it appropriate or indecent for, uh, for people who are dressing as, as their, not their gender at birth to, uh, to interact with children? Um, or is this somehow harmful? Is this recruiting? Is this all the things that are thrown at it? Right? Well, you know, hey, hey, recruit my kids. I don't have kids, but if I did, recruit them to be drag queens. How fabulous, right? Um, but. But uh, one thing I wanted to note was, of course, uh, not necessarily performance status as a drag queen, but true transgender status is a, is a protected class since Bostock, right? Um, it's the, the case that there was a, three consolidated cases went up to the Supreme Court, and you know it is Bostock, but the, 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 um, but the plaintiff, the woman in the case involving transgender status was Amy Stevens, who is unfortunately no longer with us, but she worked at the funeral home. She, she worked as a man, um, and then at some point uh, informed her employer that she would be uh, living her true gender, and the employer fired her, um, and and she she won posthumously. But it has placed trans status in uh, up up with other protected classes in a way that if someone said to me, "You can't have a trans person come and read to my children at story hour," I would say, "I'm sorry. It would be a civil rights violation not to allow that person to read to your children at story hour." Um, so. And that was actually it's a very I'm I'm, I'm glad you made that point because that was actually a point I made in the brief to the court, uh, which was saying we can't. We can't have these things represented in literature. It's harmful to children. That makes it obscene as to children, even if it's okay as to adults. And the analogy I made was, uh, you know, looking, uh, looking. It's a lot like uh, where people uh, would say, okay, well, fine. The Supreme Court says you can have uh, mixed interracial marriage, mixed race relationships, but that's just not something children should see. And so this use of, it got to your question, so I, I love, so it's so interesting, using standards of decency for this kind of uh, abusive uh, social control um, that we're still seeing today in so many ways, even in courtrooms, you know, even having to look across the table and see that that argument's being made to, to take books out and to, to keep people from doing certain things was fascinating. Uh, you know, it's a I mean, we, so we, you know, we, we had obviously Pride Month in June, and we actually did have a drag queen story hour and at Save the Children, and we invited families to bring their children, you know what I mean? Of course, it was virtual. Bring your kids, you know, um, she spoke about her story, you know, and it, it, it was it was beautiful and, and so well received, and, and we're trying to do, um, you know, different exposure techniques like that, not only with, within our staff, but also to, to, to the families of staff, but I will say that, you know, what we've done when it comes to transgender identity is, you know, we don't ask you to identify necessarily in terms of, you know, what your sex was assigned at birth. It's really just the identity that, that, that you hold down, you know, and so like when it comes to dress code or decency or, or however you, you want to express it, it's wear what you want because it's based on your identity, you know, and we're not looking at your sex assigned at birth. So I think it's also going to be, you know, an evolution from a society standpoint that we kind of get away, you know, from what I guess was assigned at birth because so much of our idea of decency, particularly when it comes to gender norms, is based on that, right? Like our, our need to, to gravitate towards what were you assigned at birth. So if we can move away from that, but again, that's where we're really kind of in the midst of it now, right? Because we're not fully there. Also, depending on where you live in the country or, you know, we're, we're just not fully there. But I like to look at it as I'm not looking at you in terms of what you were assigned as, at birth, you know, like who, who are you today and, and you tell me who that is. So, um, but again, going back to children, that's where it's a matter of who has the ability to make that decision, right? Um, is it the guardian? Is it the child? That, that's just a different conversation. Again, we're, we're just not there. Now a lot of it is algorithms. You know. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of what this boils down to is just our fear of fluidity, the yeah. freedom that can be enjoyed with fluidity. Sort of like in law, you, you know, you're dedicated to precedence. You know, we, we really need that binary socially. And if you don't, you know, you're just a little too ambiguous or too fluid, that doesn't make me feel comfortable. Are you black or are you white? You know, are you gay or straight? You know, and, and any kind of transness, you know, that, that just people go into panic and we don't really like that fluidity that the freedom that can be found in being able to change it okay well this was my sex assigned at birth and you know now I'm changing it that makes us very nervous and so we hide behind you know we start instilling moral codes laws policies procedures to just start you know and even weaponizing them at worst you know to kind of put a stop to that 
Um, Law draws lines, and that, that makes things very difficult. Yeah. I, I, lo I love that you make that point, because the converse of it is uh, clothing can, and, and adornment can be used to transgress those boundaries, but it's also used to police those boundaries, right? The first thing we do in the hospital is put the kid in a pink or a blue onesie, right? And, and, it, and it goes from there, right, all the way up through our lives. So it's a fascinating problem. I wonder, I'm seeing some, a lot of head nods. Can I throw this out open for questions from all of you? Wow. Lock up. Yes. Um, so uh, I think that this is kind of, I feel like this is such a uh, cohesive and interdisciplinary discussion. Uh, thank you. So I think that um, as um, Kimberly mentioned, how like race is so indelible from the American economic footprint, and how like that as a motivation for keeping economic power and like in luxury. To your point about what a model should look like. I think that fashion, critical as it is, is, is um, especially like in a luxury standpoint, is made to be like aspirational. And so for people to um, gain that sense of like what is aspirational, um, I think that like the, the economic power and like what people are afraid to see as aspirational is like what you're saying is like the fear of change. So I'm just curious like, you know, first of all, I think it's so funny that like the trans thing is so such a big deal because I feel like the ideal luxury fashion form is honestly like really androgynous anyway. But um, <laughs> um, so just in terms of like inserting cultural competence standards and how that affects different sizes of brands or designers and stuff like that, like you know, you're saying like, oh, me as an individual, I'm looking for um, at like at Wilhelmina, like the age of like the age of consent, or can you consent, or like if we're looking at how to inform policies for um, empl employees versus independent contractors and stuff like that. Um, I know a lot of people are inserting cultural competence, like ideas or standards, and protection is often brought in by like standardizing things. But you know, fashion has always been on like the cutting edge of so many things. Like, do you think that inserting more regulation would actually like um, like creatively affect the fashion industry in a way that also is part of the resistance and not just like the like the social contrast and like the activism that we're trying to do like I feel like sometimes people are just like the creative the creative aspect of what the fashion industry is is separate from like you know I guess just separating the policy from the art do you feel like that's part of the resistance going in like from the legal or the fashion or the business aspect that's such a great point. And you know, as someone on the inside who's worked with a couple of fashion brands and uh, also a modeling agency, um, I'm very skeptical. You know, it, it's very difficult because yes, you're working in a creative, kind of art adjacent industry, and time and time again, I mean. It, you know, Re Renee Torado, you know, only spent a year at Gucci as the DNI person. She came in right after me. And, you know, it, it's just very difficult when you're working with these people. They don't want to be told what to do. They want to have, especially when you're talking, you know, to a designer or a creative director, you know, or someone, the head of marketing. They don't want to be um, having to follow these rules of, you know, you need to check this box or meet this quota of these kinds of models in your ad campaigns now and things like that. Um, um, it, it, so it's very difficult, and that's why you see all these DNI officers just kind of falling out all over the place in these um, uh, fashion brands. And, and there's more to it, you know. The, the infrastructure isn't there. It's just not, you know. It's the culture within the company isn't ready for it, and so it just doesn't work. And and also on top of that, not only internally when it comes to the infrastructure or the culture of the brand or organization where DEI just falls flat. Um, also, just the consumers or the general audience has a hard time buying it too. And then the brand feels even more inauthentic because people look at their Instagram account for, you know, insert certain French or Italian brand, and then they roll their eyes thinking, oh my gosh, this looks just so, you know, just forced. You know, like they're just trying to check a box. It, it was 2020 and they decided to just ram all of these diverse models in here and, you know, you don't really care about us anyway. So also the brands think, well, you know, you're not taking us seriously either, so why should we even spend our time and energy on this? So it's really difficult, and I don't even know where this lands things, um, but right now we're just still seeing in 2022 D&I um, initiatives just kind of falling flat within many fashion organizations for various reasons, and consumers just not wanting to buy into these brands anymore because they find it's inauthentic. 
You know, and I'll just add and, and reiterate what, what Kim says. The infrastructure isn't there. And that's why earlier I used the word compromise, right? I had to find a way to compromise because the, the, these like fashion, when it comes to agencies and brands and stuff, it exists because the creative element is there. It's the reason why people want to get into fashion. You know, it's not as stifling as the law or engineering or whatever it is that we're told, you know, to, to, to pursue uh, to actually support ourselves. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, look, when I joined Wilhelmina, and, and I'll tell you, after Wilhelmina, I actually went to Rock Nation, um, Jay-Z's entertainment company, before I went to Save the Children's so Like I said, I've, I've been all over the place. But, um, but at Rock as well, like, look, when it comes to the infrastructure, when it comes to HR departments, like, where do you keep your personnel files? Are you completing your I-9s, right? Like, is there a, 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 a format to actually, or a platform to, you know, um, whether anonymously or, or straight out, you know, make complaints, share complaints? Is there an investigation process? That doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist in, 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 the, in those types of entities, you know? Um, which is honestly why a lot of times, you know, if you need more structure, if you need, you know, a place that has policies and procedures, Joining an agency is, is maybe not the direction I would, I would tell somebody to go, just because there could be that frustration because the infrastructure isn't there. So I agree. I mean, should there be regulations? I, I, you know, I, don't, I just don't know if we can get there just because the infrastructure isn't there to support it. And it's just a different type of mindset in terms of how the work should be done. But you succeeded so well. What was your secret? What was your strategy? Listen, I was the parent in the room. You know what I mean? I literally had people coming in like, I need a vote. I'm like, OK. <laughs> They're like, well, how do I do it? I was like, look on Google. I don't, I don't even know what state you're in. Um, but no, listen, it was an incredible time. Um, but, it w but it was a huge shift from being at a law firm because I was used to you know, mentorship and protocols. And you know, like if you had an ex if you purchase something, you needed some in an expense report. Like, so I came in at the time that our CFO, who's still there, um, who had been at Ernst & Young um, for a long time, and literally it was, a you know, we put in a lot of, you know, the HR department, we created a, a legal department that, you know, was functioning. We created, um, you know, um, you know a, a finance department that was functioning. But even there, I mean, there were certainly frustrations because, again, you had to compromise with the agents. Um, you know, we, we would have agents come in and say, well, this model hasn't paid. Can you give them them, you know, like in advance, and I'm like, like, no, no we, we're not like an open checkbook. Like, we can't do it in advance, you know. But, but maybe we need to in this situation. So it was constantly having to have those nuanced, day to day things that you know you had to decide: is this worth the argument, or is this where we're going to compromise and do things the way that it's done here, versus what I would typically do, maybe wearing a very legal hat. It's really taking on a different type of business decision. You're no longer really a lawyer. You have to think like the business. Now, now I'm imagining you as the parent in the room saying to everybody, unless you adopt these rules, until you adopt these rules, everybody goes through the children's school. Everyone goes through the children's everybody. division. <laughs> Put your clothes on, though. <laughs> Nick, Nick, great question. Excellent question. Uh, in the back, and then, uh, then, then there. This is uh, just, by the way, thank you all for bringing such tremendous panelists today. Um, my question is a little bit segueing and maybe even controversial, but how would you define, you know, the people that we see on Instagram, the models, and oftentimes having elective surgeries done when they're teens and even early 20s and making a lot of women mm -hmm. and men around the world feeling inadequate? Yeah, social media. <laughs> Wasn't there a recent article? Didn't they just come out with a study about like, the, the damages? I think that that was actually reported did, yesterday yes. or this morning yes. or something. Yeah. Um, look, social media has look. It's 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 where we are. And again, similar to the conversation we had earlier about you know gender fluidity. It's I, I don't think we have an answer on this either, right? Um, it's 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 look I, and I have a nine-year-old daughter you know who I dropped off at school this morning and you know she is talks about it because she has friends that have it so it's also starting at an age where it's so much younger than we than we were you know so you're you're not mature enough in in many instances to really even understand what this is but you know I the only thing I can say is it really comes down to again consent you know for me like do I think that children of a certain age should be looking at Instagram or have Instagram, this is personal, right? I, I don't, because I, I do think that there are going to be da damaging consequences that we don't even know. I mean, look, even when we had traditional models before social media, 
you know, there was the stigma of what you were supposed to look like, you know, super, th whatever the weight was, you know, size zero, six, you know, five, eight, and, and most people don't look like that. And that is one, one of the reasons why we had the conversation that we have to evolve in terms of what people look like. There are curvy women, there are shorter women, there are big and tall men, you know what I mean? There are black women, <laughs> there are whatever, you know, like we have to really kind of um, look at what a model is differently. And, some of the good things about social media is it gives people an opportunity to, in some sense, be a model, even if they traditionally weren't a model, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be damaging in another way. It's not necessarily that you have to be six feet and blonde to look, you know, to, to be perfect or whatever. Now it's going to be that, yeah, you have to have all sorts of whatever cosmetic changes, you know, um, or that your life has to be perfect when no one's life is perfect, you know? <laughs> And I would add to that, I, I agree that social media is damaging, and if I had children, I would not want anyone under 14 or 12 to be looking at this. And also growing up, I just, I think for both of us, we don't know what it's like to have our whole life, you know, just monitored or, you know, to broadcast your life all the time. And so it... It, so your question isn't at all like provocative. It, it's so important <laughs> to ask this and start questioning this. Um, you know, there's a difference between being someone who needs to get gender affirming surgery, you know, for the, and opt into certain aesthetics for survival. And then there's, you know, also, but then there's like young people who are seeing more than ever. I think that most of us not having to grow up like this, you know. So this, so I, I really feel for kids these days and teenagers. Um, they are seeing what's successful, what works, what wins, and what you need to look like to do that, to achieve that. And, um, you know, when you're seeing Kylie Jenner living her best life and she's got all the cars and, you know, this whole, you know, happy life broadcast on there, you think, well, what's the, the shortcut to doing that? And, you know, okay, well, if it takes me, you know, making these adjustments or modifications yeah. to my body, um, which everyone's entitled to do, um, people think that that is kind of a shortcut to success. And not to say that, you know, plastic, sur plastic surgery and body modification hasn't been around for decades, but now more than ever, especially in precarious times like this, um, and in an economy like this, you're seeing young people maybe thinking, maybe I don't need to go to college. Maybe that's a waste of time and money. I actually had a student ask me during office hours, teach me, you know, how can I become a TikTok star or, you know, in, you know Instagram? And we laugh, but she was serious because she thought, you know, this whole traditional way of go through school or get this job. No, I'm seeing all of these famous people. They, you know, this one star made $17 million just for being on YouTube. I want that and I want to look like that. Um, and then seeing... Filters. When social media started in introducing filters um, to give us uh, a, an inaccurate, you know, illusion of what we could look like, then you start chasing after that and thinking, well, I actually kind of now that you take the filter off, I don't like what I see, and so I want to look like that. Um, so now, with uh, especially when you see a lot of millennials getting Botox, and now it's just sort of like almost like a dentist visit, you know, just so accessible, and no one bats an eye at it anymore. There's no judgment or shame around it. Um, people think that, that that's what it takes. And if perfecting the body to get on in society and, and move up and make money and get love and success and all those things is what I need to do, then that's what I need to do to survive. You know, it's interesting when I was at Wilhelmina, because it was really at this rise of influencers and stuff, the, the agents actually had a, a major issue with it because they said there are all these people who think that they're models or are acting, and, and they're not real models, you know? And, and so it went back to the conversation of, you know, what is a model supposed to look like? But I remember being very fascinated by the fact that they were so resistant towards it, you know? Um, but, but to your point, the reason why they were resistant is because we're now here where you can, you know, anybody can make money off of social media. Um, you don't even have to be a Kylie Jenner, you know? It's like you can be whomever, and, and I guess if you have enough followers or, or do enough, you know? Um, you, you can evolve into that. But it's interesting. Like, I actually have these conversations with other parents that I know um, where you ask your kid now, what is it that you want to be? And I, and I, I'm, I don't even bat an eyelash anymore when like, a, a young person tells me I want to be an influencer because mm -hmm. we have, in society, created that as, as you know, as a, tra as a trajectory. We created this. We created it. <laughs>
Oh, yes, yes, we did. And you know, technology will always move beauty standards forward, right? Once upon a time, it was considered indecent to to wear makeup or to color your hair. That was a big secret, right? Now, of course, it's say rigor. Everyone does, um, and 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 we play with it, and we dye our hair purple and green when we feel like it, uh, because we don't need to hide the fact uh, that that we're we're creating body modifications. So I think that to some extent, um, uh, uh, plastic surgeries and other things will move forward as they become more accessible and less expensive. But for every movement, there's an equal and opposite movement, right? We have also the body positivity movement. So for every person who apparently, a, um, a, a, a physician once told me that in, in a selfie, your nose looks 30% larger, right? If you take the, your selfie from the wrong angle, but, but that's on average. Um, and so it, he's got patients coming in and asking for noses so small that it wouldn't be physically possible to breathe through them, right? So we have to be open about acknowledging some of the harms that can be done through modifications and also to play up the acceptance trend as well as the, um, the, the freedom to modify, which is also its own creative form. Um, Fashion has been used and decency has been used to control people, um, especially LGBT people. Um, Compton Cafeteria, Stonewall were a direct result of enforcing seminary laws against um, gay people. And now we see more attempts to define anything LGBT as indecent. You saw it in your case, if you look in Florida, in Texas, um, in a lot of the rhetoric from politicians, just the very fact of an LGBT person's existence is considered not appropriate for children to learn about. Is this going to be something that we're going to continue? Is this going to be something that we're going to see a dividing line uh, kind of down the middle of the country from blue states like this um, versus red states like Florida or Texas or Kansas, um, where you will no longer be able to do um, a national ad. Um, there's been vocal pushback for having just having a trans person in an ad, let alone um, you know a dad teaching his his son to shave. It's shocking. It's you know, destroying the American family. Can you all? It, it kind of stretches across all of your all's portions of this presentation. I have a question. It's a perfect question to end the panel on. Yeah. How is that's the future. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can start on this. It's, I, I think that you make a good point in terms of just kind of culturally where you are. When I say culturally, I mean it could be your ethnic background in terms of, you know, what you're taught at home. It could be where you live in the country. Look at my daughter's school. They celebrate Pride Month. They, they read books on LGBTQIA+. They talk about it. You know, she has a transgender PE teacher. So that's there. But we're in New York City, right? But at Save the Children, we have programs around the country because we work with them, the Head Start programs, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it provides early childhood education to children in, in rural parts of the country. And one of the things we have been looking at is let's look at our early childhood education. Like, what, what, what are the books that we're giving kids? Like, are we giving kids books and having them learn about, like, people that look like them, right? Because we're talking about rural communities. So these are oftentimes black and brown children. Um, so what kind of books are we sharing with them so they can see people that look like them in positions of power or, or professions or what have you? But one of the questions I did ask is, are we also sharing books about LGBTQIA plus communities or, or gender, you know, um, um, issues and stuff? And one of the pushbacks I've gotten is we can't go there yet in some of these communities because the teachers aren't even equipped to really understand how to address it if a parent comes and says, why are you sharing these books with my child? So I say that to say that we're in the process of having these conversations, but they're starting now because I think now is it a, we're at a time where we're open to having these conversations where we probably weren't five years ago, right? So, you know, you're right. What will the future look like? I the future needs to look like where we're introducing this kind of material into you know early childhood education so children can see themselves you know comfortably and authentically in those spaces. But we also have to be true to the fact that we're also dealing with families and communities that aren't always supportive 
of those conversations, right, and aren't equipped to be able to handle them. So it's, it's really kind of working a dual effort here, right, in terms of what we're doing with our children, but also making sure that the communities are supportive to be able to, you know, support the messaging that we're giving kids. And so, yeah, we don't have that answer yet. It's all relatively new right now. But so I think right now, from a society standpoint, it really kind of depends on where you are in the country and kind of what you're being taught at home and what's supported at home. And yeah, and that's such a great question. And it actually just kind of sends chills. It's, it's frightening um, where things are going and, and just how creative now or bold we can be with law. <laughs> and, and one thing we've seen recently even, it, it, now we're actually starting to see the lines, um, legal lines drawn throughout our country where certain states now will, you know, frighteningly over time show, you know, what their moral standards are and what you can, you know, what you're able to do with your body and how you can present yourself and move about um, in public and where you can't. So, you know, as you mentioned, you know, in New York, we can, we have a lot more freedom, but in certain states like where I'm from, Texas, it could be, you know, just become a stranglehold and very rigid in terms of how you can present yourself. And what's even more frightening of what you're mentioning is um, someone's gender identity or, or expression, much like race has been, um, how just existing, just standing and being in the presence of someone can be deemed as a threat and, you know, legal, you know, calls, you know, for someone to um, put the law against you. So um, I find it very frightening that just by existing or expressing yourself in a way, um, and now this kind of bounty culture and call out culture where, you know, you offended me and, you know, you're very present or just living, breathing presence is offending me um, and assaulting my values. And so, you know, I think, you know, you, we need to do away with you. It, it's very frightening. Um, so we're now definitely seeing from a gender perspective what's happening, what we've seen, you know, for centuries past with race um, and how, or in religion, how just, um, how someone's, you know, uh, religious dress can just be seen as a threat. You're bothering me. You're threatening me. I don't feel comfortable around this. And so we've got to get you out of here. Um, it's just sort of like what happened in France <laughs> with just women laying on the beach, you know, a Muslim women just out on the beach, you know, that's, you know. So, um, so yeah, just either assimilate within this certain, you know, um, jurisdiction or, you know, you've, you know, you've, you're a threat and you've got to be removed. In a word, I think the future will be uncomfortable yeah. because, because decency norms evolve, but they only evolve through tension and discussion. And once we reach a certain point in our social norms, the law will back us up. But it takes some conversation to get there. And we have to get used to things that maybe we locked up, or we pathologized, or we didn't allow. And when we start opening the doors to our, of our minds, as well as our rooms, to let those things in, it can be uncomfortable for a while. But it's a good kind of discomfort if it moves the conversation forward. And I kind of hope if I can have a wish that our future room is like this. I mean, look at you guys, right? Well, you're, uh, you're, you're from all over, age spectrum, size, color, uh, you name it, right? Um, and, and things that we can't see, right? Um, your, your particular identities, we can't see, uh, though we might learn if we talk to you a bit more individually. Wow, right? This is a great place to start. And this panel is an amazing place to start. <laughs> Yes, and we do hope the conversation will continue. Thank you so very much for joining us. Let me take a moment to tell you all that there's still coffee left, and we're not going to send all the muffins to the 19th precinct, but also, more importantly, to thank all of our fabulous student volunteers who made today happen, um, our amazing panelists, and Ariel Laya, our assistant director, who set all of this up. So thank you. Thank you.